Good morning, everybody. Today we are here to discuss, you know, a very interesting, controversial question. Uh, you know, my favorite type of question, <laughs> uh, and that is, why is there only one verified perfect 800 GMAT scorer in the world? Believe it or not, uh, and why was that score from all the way back in 2015? Uh, you know, almost seven years ago. Well. Uh, let's start with the visual, right? So today I've chosen uh, the Harvard Business School uh, HBS uh, stats for the uh, graduating class of 2022, uh, which is the most recent stats that they've uh, shared on the on the HBS website. And you know, I think they're very telling. So let's you know, let's take a look at them here. Um, so first of all, you know, the percent of the class that's taking the GMAT is uh, 78%. Uh, 22% taking the GRE. You know, the GRE is not an option at every business school, but, you know, this goes to show the GRE is a bit underrated as a uh, uh, GMAT admissions strategy. Uh, this particular podcast is not meant to address that issue. That's a whole nother can of worms, uh, but I'm sure I will uh, address that sooner rather than later as I, I teach both tests. Uh, I have some students who take both tests, etc. Um, and I do think in many cases the GRE is easier. And even though, you know, uh, ad comms at the top, uh, you know, business schools do understand that, it, it can still work to your advantage to take a test like the GRE, which, you know, you can see here, um, you know, uh, applicants on the GRE were able to achieve perfect scores uh, on both sections, uh, likely meaning, although the you know, GRE does not provide composite scores, it's, I would say it's highly likely that there were some 340s in there, some perfect 340s, because it's easier to, ch to achieve on the GRE. I have a perfect 340 on the GRE. Uh, you don't necessarily have to get every single question right, just close to it, uh, unlike the GMAT where to get a perfect 800, you literally have to get every single counted question correct. All 58 counted questions correct. That's 30 on verbal and 28 on quant. So let's, you know, let's pivot back to GMAT here. You know, you can see again, you know, um, applicants had up to a 51 on, on verbal, up to a 51 on quant, but the composite tops out at 790, you know, only 10 points away from a perfect 800, but that's a big difference. And, and you know, I just want to remind you guys, you know, an 800 on the GMAT is very, very rare, you know? So let's go back to the, the question at hand. Um, GMAT GMAT Club started a score verification feature uh, sometime around, I think it was 2017. Uh, and uh, that really changed the whole game because before that there were dozens of people making all sorts of ridiculous claims about their GMAT scores. Uh, some very prominent tutors, you know, claiming to have, you know, something crazy like five or six, you know, consecutive perfect 800s on the GMAT. Um, and, you know, of course, when it came time to actually prove it, uh, most of these people just kind of disappeared, right? Um, one person, uh, Marnie Murray, uh, managed to uh, verify an 800 from 2015, um, back when the test was easier. Uh, verbal in particular, and uh, back when there were even more experimental uncounted questions on the test. The GMAT was a longer test back then. Uh, even Marty, with some prodding, will admit that uh, he d is not always going to get an 800. Uh, prior to that, I believe he got a 780, and he was uh, 50 years old at the time that he finally achieved his 800. So, yeah, you know, I, I think it's important to contextualize that. Um, you know, most MBA applicants are far younger than 50 years old. Uh, as we all know, uh, being older than 26 or 27 is, is going to be uh, a disadvantage to your application. So, you know, keep in mind, you know, the only verified uh, perfect 800 GMAT score in the world, uh, first of all, got it way back in 2015 on an easier version of the test. Uh, second of all, was 50 years old at the time, right? So today I'm 41. Uh, my high, high GMAT score right now is a 770. Uh, I've scored as high as uh, 50 on quant and 48 on verbal, which if I could somehow put those together on the same test would probably come out to about a 790. <laughs> um, you know, I've tried my very best for the last 20 years to get to that 800, haven't quite gotten there either. So trust me, I can relate. But here's my point, even at Harvard Business School, the best business school in the country, arguably, not a single applicant has an 800. Well, to be fair, 
I should I, let me amend that statement. Not a single admitted student as an 800. It, it's, it's certainly possible that they did have 800 applicants, and I'm not saying that other people don't score 800 on the GMAT. Uh, you know, statistically, if you look at the numbers, I think it, it must be true that you know there are other students scoring 800 on the GMAT. I just don't think they're GMAT tutors who are interested in verifying their scores. Uh, per se, right? They're they're more so, you know, just GMAT applicants. Uh, I had one student who scored an 800, and uh, I wanted them to be more vocal about it. Uh, you know, uh, I will admit, out of selfish reasons, you know, I, I wanted uh, that person to sort of um, shout to the world that they got an 800 after working with me. But you know, to be fair, uh, they don't have to do that. It's called private tutoring for a reason. Uh, and this particular person just chose to apply and, you know, got into the vast majority of the schools they applied to and um, did so anonymously. So, you know, my point is, yes, of course, there are 800s. And if we look at some schools, uh, you know, admission uh, stats, you will see that from time to time and in certain admission years, there are 800 applicants. But, you know, they're, they're a needle in the haystack. It's, you know, um, it requires a lot of luck in addition to a ridiculous amount of preparation, right? Um, and yeah, the test has gotten harder. The test has gotten harder. It's, you know, the online test, uh, many people, if you ask them, I, I will also agree with this rumor that the quant section is more challenging. The questions are more wordy and they just have a slightly different feel on the online test. And also that the verbal got harder sometime around uh, 2017. Um, I, I started taking the GMAT around 2012 was able to get uh, 770 on my first try, 99th percentile, which was great. Um, but I remember being a little bit disappointed with my uh, quant score. I got a, um, a Q47 V48. I knew I could score higher than, than 47 on quant. And, and so I've gone in a bunch of other times and, and, and taken it. Uh, but it can be hard to, you know, to ace both sections at once. Um, I've scored 46, 47, 48 on verbal, all 99th percentile. Um, scored up to 50 on quant, um, but you know generally my scores are going to you know vary somewhere in the 700s, right? So all my scores have been somewhere between 700 and 770 uh, in my six official attempts. So I think it's been uh, 700, 710, 730, another 730 on the GMAT online, <laughs> uh, 750 uh, in 2017. Uh, with a Q50 and a 770 in, in, in 2012. Uh, these are not bad scores, right? For those of you who are, you know, uh, looking at the GMAT scoring system and thinking, why can't I get to 800? Uh, well, it's an extremely difficult test to score 800. You have to go 58 for 58 on all the counted questions. Uh, there are six questions that don't count on verbal and three that don't count on quant. If you get really lucky, I suppose you could get those wrong and well, I know you could get those wrong and still score a perfect 800, but you get the idea. Uh, 58 for 58 is just very, very difficult, in particular on an adaptive test like the GMAT, where the questions are going to get harder as they go. Right. So let's let's take a final look at the numbers here. So the median verbal on, on at our HBS 42. That makes sense to me. That's about 96 percentile. It's an excellent verbal score. Um, the median quant is about 48, also an excellent quant score, despite the percentile. Uh, it might not look that impressive, but you know you can see that's on average that's um, you know the average or median quant score of an admitted Harvard Business School applicant for the class of 22. And then finally, uh, the median GMAT score 730, still a great score, um, but important to keep you know. Just to, just to sort of calibrate your expectations and to keep that in mind that what not, might not appear to be necessarily an elite GMAT score of 730 is in fact an elite score because uh, on average that's the that's the score for an admitted student at Harvard Business School. Um, and then finally, just to pivot back to the GRE for a second, uh, the median verbal and median quant are both 163. You know, looking at that and having taken both tests and tutored both tests for a long time, I will admit it's much easier to score 163, 163 on the GRE than it is to score a 48-42 on the GMAT. Um, and so if you ask me, the reason why most of these GRE applicants are taking the GRE is because they know their GMAT scores aren't going to help them, you know? And, and I do think that's in many ways why, uh, you know, business schools have started accepting the GRE because it's really a win-win situation, right? Uh, if you start accepting the GRE, 
then usually what happens is your average GMAT score will go up because instead of requiring, uh, you know, that 100% of your students take the GMAT, only the students who feel that they can achieve high scores on the GMAT do take that test. And then the students who are perhaps wary of standardized tests, uh, you know, are sort of self-selecting and they'll take the GRE instead, right? But the GRE results don't affect the GMAT results. Uh, yes, they're a little bit less impressive, but they make the GMAT results more impressive. And, it, you know, it's a good avenue. Again, I'll have a different podcast for this, but, you know, it's a good avenue for those of you who are, you know, maybe not the best at standardized tests. Uh, you have strong work experience. You have strong grades in college, uh, strong intangibles. Uh, and so you just need to survive a standardized test. In some cases, the GRE can be much more forgiving because um, it's only section adaptive instead of question level adaptive, for example. Um, and the fact that you could move around questions instead of, you know, uh, having uh, not being able to move on like you can on the, on the GMAT, you have to do one question at a time and you can't go back. And just overall, it's, you know, generally speaking, depending on your strengths, a more forgiving test. So anyway, I've been talking for 11 minutes now, it's longer than my average podcast. I hope you enjoyed it and uh, good luck on your GMAT or your GRE or both.